All right, so tonight I want to just talk about, I'm just, I, haven't, I didn't have time to prepare a PowerPoint, but um, I'm just going to talk about uh, same-sex marriage. And I, I, I basically, when I was marching yesterday, I did have some words that I was saying as I was marching. Um, so I just sort of expanded on that and just wanted to um, talk a bit more about the things uh, that I shared with the crowd there as, as I was walking in with the public. But, but if you went to the march, obviously you would have heard a bit of it. So some of it might have been a repeat for you guys. But even you guys that were there, um, you know, you weren't with me all the way. So you didn't really hear the whole thing. But I think it's been recorded by some people and put online. But I just wanted to expand on that and just talk about that. Just so you can have a bit of ammunition, you know, as you go out and talk about uh, same-sex marriage, quote unquote, you know, you talk about homosexuality and, you know, I don't necessarily have all the, you know, I don't know whether I have all the best arguments and all the best answers, but, you know, hopefully that just adds to your arsenal. So as you talk to people and you hear the objections and you hear the arguments, you can at least uh, give them an answer for the hope that's in you. Um, just a bit of an update about the march. Uh, that happened yesterday. Um, I, th I think it was a resounding success. I think Philippa did a great job, you know, organizing it, you know, and, and, and pulling it off. I, I, it was amazing how many people uh, registered to go. There was like, um, I believe there was like over 500 that registered, but, I, uh, but when we got there, there was like over a thousand people. Like if you see the video footage later, there was, t there was way more than I think than we had ever expected. And even when I was talking to the people in the crowd there, um, a lot of people were saying, like, uh, a lot of people they know didn't know about it. And then there was, uh, like, lots of other people that would have come had they known about it. So we did everything we could to try and get the word out. Um, it was just unfortunate that some of the organisations didn't want to help get the word out. But at the end of the day, I think it was a huge success. And I've shared with you guys, I'm, I'm a little disappointed that more of us didn't go. You know, some of us did, but not all of us did. Um, I think it would have been great if more of our church um, would go. But, you know, maybe, maybe I, I don't know whether I'm expecting a bit too much. You know, like not everyone's committed to coming to church. So I don't know whether they would be committed to going something outside of church. But I definitely think it was a good thing. Uh, I know the, the homosexuals are having their pro same-sex marriage march in the city today. Um, it'd be interesting to see how many people go, but I think a lot of them would, because I think it was promoted by the Sydney Mardi Gras and everything like that. And they're, you know, they're already used to going out there and doing their marches and whatnot, whereas there isn't really that many uh, marches or public displays from the conservative side, which is, which is unfortunate. But hopefully people still have a lot of sense in Australia to, to vote no and to realize that homosexuality is not natural, it's a detriment to our society. And, um, and, and uh, we don't you know, redefine uh, marriage in Australia to include uh, same-sex couples. So I wanna just start here in 1 Peter 3. I'll go through a couple of things I shared there and just uh, talk about marriage. But in 1 Peter 3, the Bible says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So we are actually exhorted in the word of God to be ready to always give an answer, to be ready to answer the objections, to be ready to give a defense of our faith. And like I talked about last week, you know, we don't want to be destroyed for a lack of knowledge. We don't want to not know what we believe, be, be ignorant of, of the issues that are out there so that we are not ready to give an answer to every man that asketh the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now, when you, when you listen to the news and you listen to uh, you know, the same-sex marriage crowd trying to argue for the redefinition of marriage in Australia, there really isn't that many reasons that they give in order to redefine marriage. And, and you'll, you'll notice it's really just the same mantras, the same uh, reasons, the same slogans that they give again and again and again. And, and you'll realize that when, when we talk about these, they're really just catchy slogans and marketing slogans and chants. They, they really have uh, you know, no real good argument in order to redefine marriage. But here's, here's a couple that we can, uh, we can go over. What are some of the common reasons used to argue for the legal re redefinition of marriage? And the one you'll hear most often is this idea of marriage equality. 
You know, they always saw, even, even when they talk about it on the news and politicians get up and talk about it, they always describe those that are for true marriage, right? That are actually for marriage, which is what really marriage is between a man and a woman. They'll call us that we're anti-marriage equality, right? And, you know, marriage equality, it's, it's just a slogan that is really a misnomer. A misnomer is just, you know, it's something that it, it is called something, but it's not really the case. And, and why do I say that? Because we already have marriage equality in Australia, right? By the, the actual definition of marriage, right? We have equality already. Why? Because everybody has the right. Everybody can marry somebody of the opposite gender. Nobody no, it's, not, it's not illegal to marry somebody of the opposite gender for some people and for other people. No, everybody is able to marry somebody of the opposite gender and enter the marriage covenant. So there is equality there. So it's not really equality that they're after. What they actually want is they want to redefine the word marriage to include homosexuality. But see, when it comes to equality, we have that too, because I can marry somebody of the opposite gender, but I, I'm also prohibited from marrying somebody from the same gender. So I have that same equality as everybody else. We're, we're all treated in terms of marriage the same way. There isn't an in inequality for marriage. What they want to turn marriage equality into is redefining marriage to include homosexuality. And that's really what this that, that this discussion is about, is whether or not we redefine the term to include homosexuality. Now, there are obviously other things that they want with equality when they talk about equality. They talk about um, you know, issues with taxation, issues with, um, with property laws. Um, but you know, issues with taxation and issues with property laws, you know, they, they, they're not, they shouldn't be resolved by redefining marriage, right? If, there, if, there's, if there's an issue with how the government's taxing us and they're making it unfair for some people and fair for others, then that's a problem with taxation law. That's not a problem with marriage laws. You, know, you don't change what marriage is to fix another problem. You know, if you want to fix the problem of taxation laws or property rights, then you need to look at those laws. You know, if somebody's unable to give their property to somebody else and for whatever reason it's being inhibited by the government, then that's an issue of property rights and property laws. That's not an issue of marriage. Or they talk about social recognition. You know, they want equality and recognition. But that's not the reason why government gets into the marriage business, right? The government's not there to validate all your lifestyle choices, right? The government's there to do what's right. It's there to promote things that are, are good to society and, and, you know, punish things that are bad for society. It's not just about social recognition and giving your relationship some value and i mean ideally you know even as christians do we need a marriage certificate from the government to give our relationship value no right so it's not that it's not that we need the government's stamp of approval in order to get married and it somehow validates our relationship somehow gives our relationship value no no the reason why government needs to define marriage because it needs to enforce laws surrounding marriage right it doesn't need to put a stamp of approval it doesn't need to allow you to get married right it just once you do get married there are rules that need to be abide abided about by by is that the right word um, in, in a society. So the law doesn't exist to validate, you know, our relationship choices. Um, it's there to, to uh, do good to society and protect evil and whatnot and keep a society moral and clean and pure. So marriage equality is, is not, it's, you know, it's, it's not even the real reason why they are, you know, trying to fight for the redefinition of marriage because there already is equality. Now, another one that they'll say is love is love. You'll hear that slogan all the time. Love is love and there should be no dif distinction between different loves as though every love is the same and, and every love, you know, therefore is, can be the basis for marriage. But that's not even true. And I don't even think the people that promote same-sex marriage would agree with that. And even when I was in the park that day, there was a guy there from the media and he was interviewing me um, and he was talking basically along those lines. But even he, he wanted to vote yes for same-sex marriage, but he, then he, he didn't agree with polygamy. But then it's like, well, but if love is love, then what's stopping people from marrying on the basis of love multiple people? So not all love is the same. 
and, and, and is the reason for marriage. See, we don't, we, don't, we don't believe marriage is between a man and a woman just because love is love and it's just based on love, therefore they can marry. That's not the argument for why marriage is between one man and one woman. Because if that, if that is the argument for why marriage is between one man and one woman, then if it's just about love, then why can't homosexuals marry? Right? If it's just about love. Why can't multiple people marry? Why can't somebody marry their mom because they love their mom? Why can't somebody marry their dad because uh, they love their dad? And that's the thing. Not all... Um, sorry, just let me put this on. Not all love is the same and should be used for the re reason for marriage. You know, I love my mother, I love my sister, I love my daughter, but does that mean that I should be legally allowed to marry them? You know, so you'd have to think about that reasoning if love is love. Or they'll, talk, or they'll say something like this. They'll say like, you know, why are you against legalizing same-sex marriage when it won't affect your marriage? Like it has no effect on you. But then if you use that reasoning for other laws, there are laws in place that don't necessarily affect me, right? Like, uh, you, you, uh, you know, like, like the example I used is you could say murder, right? Like abortion. You know, I don't, I don't ever plan on killing my children. I don't ever plan on having an abortion. But does that mean that there shouldn't be a law to prevent people from getting abortions because it's detrimental to society? So there are, it's just because a law doesn't affect your personal life and doesn't affect your immediate circle. That doesn't mean that the government shouldn't have a prohibition there or a law in place for the good of society. So that again is not a very good argument for why something should be law just because it doesn't affect somebody personally. Um, when really same-sex marriage, I mean, it does, it does affect other people, right? It does affect the people that um, are being raised by same-sex couples and are being, children are being adopted to them um, because that's ultimately what they end up pushing for, even though the redefinition of marriage doesn't cause one. When they are accepted, eventually they want that as well. And we see that all around the world. We see that even in Australia now. You know, because they are recognized as de facto, they are given children to adopt. You know, there's no problem with them using, you know, uh, sperm donors and whatnot to have children and deny children of their biological mother and father. So just because a law doesn't affect me personally, that doesn't mean that the government shouldn't prohibit it for a certain reason. Now, the last one I talked about, and I, and I posted a blog post about this, I thought it was just really interesting because you always hear this said again and again, that we who do not support redefining marriage to include same-sex couples, we're just, we're just like these bigots that just deny people of their basic fundamental human rights. And you hear that again and again and again. I'm always just wondering, I, I mean, first of all, like, who even decides what is a fundamental human right? You know, because for us, it comes from the Bible, right? Things that you have a right to and whatnot. But people that don't believe the Bible, I mean, where are they getting it from? And most of them are getting it from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So this is a statement. Um, basically, these, all these statements, I, I can't remember how many there were. But in 1948, all these countries got together and they drafted this document saying, hey, these are the fundamental human rights that everybody should be afforded. And when you read through them, some of them are actually pretty, pretty, like, they, they can't be a right. Because one of the rights is like you, you have a right to medical treatment and you have a right to education and things like that. But what people don't understand is like, education must be given by somebody, right? When you, when you have a right to education, Education is a service that somebody has to provide for you. They need to be a teacher. It's the same with medical care. Like medical care is not just this ambiguous right that you have to. Medicine and Medicare and, 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 and medical treatment, it's, it's a service that's provided by somebody else. You can't have a right to somebody else's services. You know, that'd be like saying, you know, I have a right to have my hair cut short, you know, and then therefore, you know, I have a right, so the government needs to pay for me to get haircuts and whatnot. I mean, obviously, people know that, uh, you know, I'm not saying that I'm equating, you know, getting a haircut with education and medicine. Obviously, those things are more important. But the principle still, apl still applies that these are a, a service and you can't have a right to somebody else's services. But these are included in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So I'm, I'm by no means saying that's the basis of where we get our human rights from. But I'm pretty sure this is where they're getting this idea from. That th this idea that they have that being able to marry is a fundamental human right because they're getting it from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that was drafted in 1948. I just want to read for you Article 16 because Article 16 is the article that talks about the human right 
to, to marry and found a family. And I'll just, read, uh, I'll just read statement one and statement three from article 16. But it says here, men of, and women of full age, without limitation due to race, nationality or religion, have the right to marry and to found a family. Uh, they are entitled to equal rights as to marriage, during marriage and at its dissolution. So, so statement three says, the family is the natural and fundamental group unit of society and is entitled to protection by society and the state. So you know what's interesting about this declaration in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in Article 16 is that sexual orientation, you know when, when we talk about discrimination and whatnot in the workplace, they always say you can't discriminate on, on gender, uh, race, nationality and religion and then they now they've included sexual orientation as a thing that you can't discriminate against in the workplace so but what, one thing that's interesting in this universal declaration of human rights is that sexual orientation is not listed when it says you sh without any limitation due to it's just got race nationality or religion and you know it's always interesting that when you talk to people about same-sex marriage right they always say that Oh, you know, well, they always compare it to racism, you know, like where they say, oh, back in the day, you know, people were racist, but they got over that. And now people, you know, are against homosexuals, but then they're going to get over that too. And they sort of like to equate race with homosexuality. And why do they do that? Because they believe that homosexuals are born that way, right? They believe that homosexuals have no, through no choice of their own, through no uh, outside influence, are just homosexuals because that's how they were born. That's how they were made, which is completely not true. Um, and and it's, it's so easy to disprove because you have all these twin studies where these studies, they, they study identical twins and an identical twin is when the twins have the exact same DNA and one of the twin becomes a homosexual and one of them doesn't. But if they're born that way and there's something genetic about homosexuality, that means both of them should be homosexual. And then you have people that are homosexual and then they stop becoming a homosexual, like they decide to leave that, that lifestyle. Or you have people like that, that, that boy on the 60 Minutes, I don't know if you guys heard about the 60 Minutes take where this boy at 12 years old, his, his mom had bought into this whole transgender ideology and started giving him estrogen pills that was prescribed to her uh, so that he would grow breasts and his, his puberty would be stunted and all this crazy stuff. And then a couple of years later, he changed his mind. Fancy that, that he wanted to be the gender that he actually was. He wanted to be a boy. And, and, and 60 Minutes was sort of covering that story, just asking the mom, like, do you regret giving him all this medical treatment and basically doing all this crazy stuff to him? Um, but you know what happened is, I guess maybe because of the postal plebiscite that's coming up, they, they pulled it off the air. So there was all these promos going on for it and it was going to be aired on a Sunday night. And then Sunday night came and it didn't air. I wonder why. I wonder why it didn't air. Uh, well, I'm not actually wondering. We all know why. Um, so, so yeah, they, they're not born that way. And, and the reason why they want to convince the world uh, that they're born that way is so that they can claim it as a human right. Because if you have no choice, it's like, it's like race, right? Yeah, you know, and obviously we don't believe in different races, like your nationality, but you know, if you're born with dark skin, or you're born with black hair, that's something you can't change. So why should you be discriminated based on that? So that makes sense, right? Your gender, you can't, you can't change, right? Um, your race, you can't change, but your sexual orientation is a choice. But they're trying to make it out that you're born that way because they are trying to lump it in with having that right and not being discriminated against based on something that they can't control. But it is a choice that is made. But it's interesting, why, why isn't sexual orientation, and I, 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 honestly, I don't know why, but I'm just this is kind of like what, I'm, what I think. You know, why is sexual orientation not mentioned in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as a, as a limitation? And, and I believe it's because it's the right, when you read it, it says they have the right to marry and to found a family. So when it talks about founding a family, that's, that's talking about raising children. You know, when, when the Universal Declaration of Rights says you have the right to marry and to found a family, the Universal Declaration of Rights is saying that you have the ability to marry and to have children. That's why it's not based on sexual orientation, because if you're a homosexual, you can't have children, right? You, you don't have children. Um, and the other interesting thing is in Statement 3, it says the family is the natural and fundamental group unit of society. So... 
homosexuals, you know, a same-sex couple, they can't naturally and fundamentally ever have children. Right? That's, just, that's just not even a possibility. That's just, this is why this human right, when they talk about having a human right for homosexual relationships, this human right doesn't actually apply to them because the, because the human right is to marry and to found a family and it's talking about the natural and fundamental group and homosexuals can never naturally and fundamentally have children unless they get help from a third party, unless they have a sperm donor or unless they have a, a surrogate mother. Um, and commercial surrogacy is something that is not legal in Australia yet, but I'm sure it'll be coming down the pipeline as we continue to take steps towards, uh, you know, this, uh, this transgender and homosexual agenda. Um, now, one thing that people will say, and uh, it was funny because even when I was talking to this report, he sort of said the same thing as well. One objection that they have is they say, but, but same-sex couples already have children. Right, they already have children, so, so what is redefining marriage going to do to that? And, and I agree, right? I, I think well, you know, it, they are separate in the sense that you know, redefining marriage doesn't necessarily give homosexuals a right to children because that's already happening, right? We haven't redefined it. One thing that it will, hap will happen is it'll make it even more socially acceptable, right? Because if, they, if we redefine marriage and then we classify same-sex couples as a family, it'll be more socially acceptable for them to have children. But see, in order to do this, in order for a same-sex couple to have children, they have basically forced a child into a step-parent situation, right? Because, and, that, and that's not an ideal because, you know, the, the child does not have two fathers. The child does not have two mothers. You know, even if that same-sex couple used one of their seed in order to produce this child, the, the parent, the other, the, the partner of one of those parents is now a step-parent. It's not that that child has two mothers or two fathers. And I think this is why you now hear, you know, uh, stories of people like Katie Forst that have been raised by same-sex couples. Um, and I think another was Millie Fontana, where, you know, they're raised by same-sex couples. And, and they have... They, they have a natural wondering, they have a natural inclination to find out who their other parent was. And, and of course you would, right? Because if you're raised by a same-sex couple and you start to learn about biology, you start to see that all your friends have mothers and fathers and you know that a mother and father creates a child, I mean, you're naturally going to wonder, you know, who created you? Who's your mother? Who's your father? So, you know, in order to do this, they had to either force a child into a step-parent situation or totally, you know, treat them like an orphan and put them into uh, basically a foster situation. And this is not something that's ideal, you know. This is not something that should be promoted in a society um, and, and just strip children of their right to their biological mother and father. This is not right and should not be promoted by anybody, uh, 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 even less so the government. So, but, you know, one of their objections might be, you know, it's true that foster parents or even children raised in a step family situation may end up having a better outcome than people raised by their biological parents if the biological parents are not responsible, right? So they'll say, oh, you know, but, you know, foster parents can potentially do a better job than, uh, you know, than the biological parents. But this is not ideal. You know, that's like saying, let's create orphans just because you know, some orphans turned out better than people raised by their biological parents. Um, so yeah, let's, let's just create a bunch of orphans uh, without, you know, strip them all of their parents and then give them to other families. I mean, is, is that something that should be promoted and just, uh, you know, promulgated in, in a society? Of course not, because it's not the ideal. Um, the ideal is we want to strengthen. We want to, we want to, if marriage is not doing well, if people are not, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, having the right perspective, if marriages are falling apart, maybe we should fix that problem rather than put on a Band-Aid solution and just give the kids to somebody else um, because uh, you know, marriages are failing in our country because we're getting away from biblical principles, we're getting away from how a marriage ought to be and um, you know, now they have this argument against us because marriage is not working. So my point in bringing up the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is you know, because one, one main reason why it's a natural and fundamental group unit of society um, and, and it's entitled to protection by the society and the state is because of children. You know, that's why, that's why marriage has to be protected, right? Because of, of children, the children that it may create. 
So if somebody is trying to use the argument, let's say you're talking with somebody and they're using the argument to say homosexual, homosexual relationships is a fundamental human right, and they're basing it on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, then the question is, if they're using this argument, if their argument is based on this, then they need to accept that there will be consequences for children. Because a lot of people that are, are voting yes and are for same-sex marriage, you know, I won't do this every time, but this is what you, every time I say same-sex marriage, this is what I mean, right? Marriage, because it's not called marriage. But every time, every time you hear people talk about it, they say, well, it has nothing to do with children. You know, it's not going to have any effect on children. It's just redefining marriage. And, and I get that argument. But if they're making the argument that it's based on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and they have a human right to marry and to found a family, then you can't deny that it will have effect on children. Because how are you going to fulfill a homosexual's right to have a family without somehow giving them, you know, putting a child and stripping a child of their biological mother and father, either their mother or their father or both? Because that will be the only way for them to fulfill that right because they can never have children on their own. A homosexual couple cannot produce children. No matter how hard they try, they need a third party to enter and, and, and either donate a sperm or be a surrogate in order to carry that child through for nine months. Or if you say that, or if you say that um, you know, homosexuals, uh, or, or you say, well, no, it's not, it's not based on that, then uh, you, if you have to be able to found a family to have that human right, then that human right doesn't apply to them. So they can't kind of have it both ways if they're going to base their human rights on the Declaration of Human Rights. And if that's not, their, what, not what they're basing it on, then I don't know where they're getting it from, right? And then if they start talking about that's just their opinion and whatnot, I mean, that's easy to sort of debunk, right? Because if, if morality is just based on our opinion, then what is, what is right or wrong? What is right and true if it's not based on a higher authority than and ourselves? So you know these slogans that they use, you know, marriage equality, love is love, you know, it won't affect you, um, you know, it's a fundamental human right. You know, th these are really catchy slogans and they're catchy marketing, but they're not good reasons to redefine marriage. And the reason why they're not good reasons is if they use these reasons, and this is why people are worried about this slippery slope that's going to come, because if the reason why we redefine marriage to include same-sex couples is marriage equality, love is love, it's not going to affect your marriage, it's a fundamental human right, and it's not even based on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it's just, it's a right because I said it's a right and we should just have the right to do whatever we want because we want to do it and we love and whatnot, that is the same argument that can be used to justify any other sort of sexual relationship. It can be used to justify incest. It can be used to justify polygamy. And that's the problem. So we're not saying that homosexuality is equated with polygamy because people don't seem to like that. I know the Bible sort of just sort of puts them all together. So we definitely believe that they're all just as perverse as another. But what we're saying is we're not saying that homosexuality will necessarily cause polygamy or homosexuality will necessarily cause bestiality or necessarily cause incest. But what we're saying is if you're going to redefine marriage based on those reasons, those arguments can be used to justify polygamy. And, and let me just do that for you now, because let's say, you know, if it's, if somebody wants a polygamous relationship, right, and they say, well, marriage equality, well, if they're marrying multiple people, why, don't, why doesn't their marriage get equality? You know, why, why is equality only extended to same-sex couples and you know, uh, different, uh, different gender couples, but it's not extended to multiple people, right? Because if it's just based on equality, I mean, where does equality stop? If it's just based on equality, if it's not based on some sort of biological law, some sort of principle that comes outside of, uh, of the law. Or they say love is love. Well, you know, what, what, what makes their love any less legitimate, right? If, if marriage is just based on love. And uh, another one is, you know, it won't affect your marriage. Well, how does somebody, how does a Muslim across the street in this neighborhood having a polygamous marriage, how does that affect my marriage? You know, it, you know when people say, like, if you don't like gay marriage, don't get a gay marriage? Well, you could say the same thing about polygamy. You could say, if you don't like a polygamous marriage, don't get a polygamous marriage. Have your monogamous marriage. So you see how it's not just these slogans that are the basis for marriage. And if they are, the slippery slope is inevitable. I get it's not this butterfly effect that they keep sort of, uh, you know, 
uh, you know, just making fun of and ridiculing. I, I saw this one video where this guy, like, he just drops a pencil and then there's this atomic bomb that just drops, you know, just making fun of this, this, this whole slippery slope argument. We're not saying that there's just this domino effect that just one after, the ha one after the other happens. But what we're saying is if you allow them to justify redefining marriage based on these flawed arguments, then other people will then take up those arguments. It will set a precedent for other people to push for their agenda, and that's why these, these uh, steps keep taking steps, even though they're independent steps, because one, sometimes, some, one ends up leading to another group wanting to advocate for their behavior. <sighs> so, let's talk about some reasons for why, and now, so that's sort of some of the things I was sharing when I was at that march yesterday. But what is, what is wrong with same-sex marriage? from a biblical point of view. Well, let's go to a couple of verses here. I'll just start at Leviticus 20. Because I want to show you here in the Bible that homosexuality, according to, according to the Bible, it's a sin. And I mean, obviously, this is not an argument that's just going to be accepted by somebody that doesn't already believe the Bible. But as Christians, this is, uh, this is one of the main bases for why we believe same-sex marriage is a problem, because same-sex marriage inherently includes homosexuality, right? It's not, a just, it's not just about this commitment that people have to each other. You need to realize that same-sex marriage, ultimately, when you boil it down, it's about the physical sexual relationship between two people of the same gender. Because nobody's against two men raising a child in the sense that if it's an unfortunate situation, because you can have brothers, right, raising a child in an unfortunate situation. Or you can have people that live together, right? A lot of people room together and they're really good friends and they spend a lot of time together. They, they might even become such good friends that they share assets and things like that. And they have these different agreements and commitments to one another. But when we talk about same-sex marriage, what it boils down to is should these two people that love one another and committed to one another be allowed to actually engage in sexual intercourse with each other? Um, and according to the Bible, homosexuality is a sin. In Leviticus 20.13, it says, If a man also lie with mankind, as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death their blood shall be upon them. Now that's a very serious punishment for what we in this society, a lot of people think is a very minor sin. They think like, what's the big deal with homosexuality? Whereas the Bible actually prescribes capital punishment to these sins outside of marriage. And I'll explain, I'll explain a bit more about why that is in a moment. But some people will say, well, you know, that's just the Old Testament. That's the, you know, we, we live in the New Testament and whatnot. But let's go to the New Testament. Let's go to Romans 1, in verse 26, where it talks, where Paul writes about homosexuality. And we learn in the New Testament that homosexuality is still a sin. It's not just something that was temporary, that was in the Old Testament. No, in the New Testament as well, homosexuality is still a sin. In Romans 1, 26, it says, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature, and likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust, one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. So you see how it's an error, it's something that should not be done. The recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Do you see, so you see there are things that are natural for a human being to do. And one of them is to fornicate. I mean, one of them is to have this sexual desire. But the reason why people go on to lust after other men and to lust after animals and to lust after all these weird things is because God eventually at a point where they reject God and they want to live in this lasciviousness, God basically takes off the limiters and just says, you know what? If you want to live in uncleanness, you want to live in fornication, you want to do all these wick, wicked and sinful and weird things, he just says, just, just go for it and just have it. That's what it means when he gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Now, not convenient means things that are sinful. So we can see in the New Testament, I want to go to Ephesians 5. 
Because I've read articles online where people talk about, oh, you know, the Bible doesn't really mention homosexuality that much. It doesn't really talk about... I mean, I don't know how many times the Bible needs to condemn something clearly enough in order for it to be a sin. You know, I mean, the Bible just needs to mention it once in the New Testament that it's unseemly, you know, it's an error, it's sinful. But what they're forgetting is that homosexuality is included in fornication. See, fornication is sexual activity outside of marriage. So marriage is between one man and one woman. Anything outside of that is fornication, either two people that are not married or married people sleeping with people that they're not married to. Fornication includes people sleeping with animals too, but it also includes people that are of the same gender because that is not a marriage. That, that is not uh, confined within a marriage. So the Bible condemns fornication. In Ephesians 5, it says here, but fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient. So you see that word there, not convenient, just means they're not, sin they're not right, right? They're, they're sinful. But rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that no whoremonger nor unclean person. So we see we're, we're, we're linking it back here to people that are fornicating, right? Because you see the fornication and uncleanness, and we see the whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So this passage here is obviously not teaching a work salvation that we need to turn from our sins to be saved. You know, we're saved by just believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. But what it shows here is that fornication and homosexuality is sinful. It's not something that Christians should be promoting and Christians shouldn't have a problem with. And you know, I, when I hear Christians who support same-sex marriage, it, it just, it, it's just a shame on Jesus Christ that people take the name of Jesus Christ and they, and they say they're going to vote yes. They say that there's nothing wrong with homosexuality when the Bible clearly states that homosexuality is a sin, that it is wrong. Now, Christians who support same-sex marriage, I mean, honestly, they're, they're, either, they're either deceived by somebody teaching them that homosexuality is okay, or, or they're ignorant. Maybe they're just ignorant about what the Bible says. You know, they're just a Christian. They've just grown up in a Christian home. They don't really know what the Bible says about Christianity, and they're just bought into this, this ideology that homosexuality is okay, or they're being deceptive. Right? Or, or, they're, or they're, you know, they're, 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 they're just taking the name of Christ, but they know that they're doing a disservice to Christ and just taking that name anyway. And they're deceiving people into thinking that homosexuality is okay. They just take the name. They, 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 don't, know, they, don't, they don't care what it means. Or maybe they do care what it means, but they have a different idea of what Jesus taught. To them, they just created a God in, in their own image. And then they're just teaching that homosexuality is okay when it's not. And you know, this is really something that's really disappointing with the mainstream Christian movement. And even the mainstream Christians that are on television talking about same-sex marriage, talking about legalizing same-sex marriage. Because I remember hearing a, an interview, even by Lyle, Lyle Shelton, is the, uh, he's basically the, the main organizer of the Australian Christian lobby. I even remember hearing in an interview that he did with somebody, when somebody asked him about homosexuality, he said, oh, I don't have a problem with, with homosexuals. I don't, have any, I don't have anything against them. He just doesn't want, want same-sex marriage to affect children and, all, and things like that. But, but how, can, how can somebody that stands up and, and represents Christians as an Australian Christian lobby say that they have no problem against homosexuals? I mean, obviously we have a problem with what they do, right? We have a problem with homosexuality. How can we not have a problem with the people performing it? That would be like, that would be like a Christian saying, I have, I have no, absolutely nothing against murderers. You know, that would be a silly thing to say, right? Because murder is a sin. He said, I have no, nothing against liars. I have nothing against... I mean, obviously, we have a problem with that. So why would we say we have no problem at all with homosexuals? It'd be like saying, I have no problem with an adulterer. You know, of course I have a problem with it because they're doing something that is wrong. Um, so we can't say we don't have anything against them. Obviously, we have that against them um, uh, of committing homosexuality. Now, Jesus was really clear. Matthew 19. That marriage was between one man and one woman. And he said, Jesus says here, And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. 
Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. So it's really clear in the Bible that Jesus taught that marriage was between one man and one woman, not between two men and not between two women. And what he's quoting here is in Genesis 2, where God actually created the first man and woman. And it says here, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. So I believe what Adam is saying here is, you know, that's kind of like the vows that we take, where we become one flesh. You take them as your wife, and they, and they become one. So therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. I read one comment on social media where somebody was saying, well, Adam and Eve weren't even married. And, and, and the Bible is really clear. No, 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 they were married because see, in verse 25, it calls Adam and Eve the man and his wife. So they, they were married. This was a marriage that took place. And then later on, Adam knew his wife and she conceived and bare a son. So Christians or supposed Christians who are supporting same-sex marriage, they are clearly going against the, the, the teachings of Jesus Christ and going against what the scriptures teach. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians 6. Because when we talk about what's the problem with same-sex marriage, we need to think about what is the purpose of marriage? You know, what, why does God have this institution and what, what purpose does it serve? Now, one, thing, one purpose that marriage serves is that it, it ba basically binds a couple into an exclusive relationship, right? Where, where sexual activity is permitted. That's pretty much what marriage is, if you think about it. It's basically, it's binding two people together. They're coming together, let not man put asunder. And the Bible teaches that the marriage bed is undefiled. That is where sexual activity is allowed within the confines of marriage. Now, why is that? Let's read in 1 Corinthians 6 here. We'll go to verse 15. It says here that, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ, so the, basically the body parts, the members of Christ, and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body, for two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Verse 18, flee fornication. So remember, fornication is sex outside of the bounds of marriage. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Why is that? Because it's unclean, right? There's diseases that happen when fornication is allowed to run rampant. If fornication is not, is not limited to marriage and people are just having sex with each other, just right, left, right and centre, then this, this is why there is sexually transmitted diseases. There is diseases that are transmitted through sexual activity because sex in and of itself is not something that is clean. It's something that is an unclean act, but it's allowed within the bounds of marriage for the procreation and for other different purposes. But because it's contained between two people, this, this spread of disease is contained. Verse 19, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So one of the reasons why marriage binds a couple into an exclusive sexual relationship is because of the spread of disease. That is one thing God wants to stop in a society, this spread of disease that happens, because a lot of these sexually transmitted diseases are not curable. You know, they cause a lot of problems and, and, and you know, uh, homosexual activity is often known for spreading things like AIDS and HIV because they are very promiscuous type of people. So the prevention of sexually transmitted diseases. If we, if we read on in 1 Corinthians 7, we see another purpose for why this is an exclusive relationship and why the, the people that sleep together, when they sleep together, they ought to be bound together in marriage. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. 
Let the, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. But I speak this by permission and not of commandment. For I would that all men were even as myself, but every man had this proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide, even as I, but if they cannot contain let them marry for it is better to marry than to burn so another reason why marriage is this binding between you know a, a couple in an exclusive relationship and it's actually legally enforced is because i think i believe it's because of the emotional well-being that happens between a couple you see there are certain obligations that a husband has to a wife and a wife has to a husband where they need to fulfill each other's sexual desire and, and, and this, you know, this sexual relationship between two people, it creates a very intimate and a very strong emotional bond between those two people. And that's why they need to be committed to one another to fulfill that obligation and to take care of one another. Um, that's why we have these marriage vows. That's why we have the marriage vows that you love and you cherish, that you, you, you to have and to hold. You make this promise to one another because when two people sleep together, they create an emotional bond. And that's why people, unfortunately, that have committed fornication in the past or they've had these sexual relationships with people in the past before they got married, it's something you really can't forget, you know, because it's such an intimate moment. It's just something that, that even though you've done this in the past and you try to forget it, you try and move on, that person has this special place in your heart already just because of the experiences that you've shared together. And, and this is the problem, right? This is, this is why it needs to be, there needs to be this commitment between a husband and one wife, because if there isn't and that relationship breaks and that desire has already been awakened and somebody you know, already knows what it feels like to fulfill that sexual gratification, they will go and seek it somewhere else. And this is why there is this obligation between a husband and a wife to fulfill that obligation, because if you don't, it's such a strong desire, it's such a strong, uh, um, is that the word, I'm, it's, it's such a strong uh, fe like feeling, and um, uh, what is, what's the word I'm looking for when it's like, it's something that's like instinctive, it's something really strong, that it needs to be taken care of, it needs to be, it needs to be nurtured within the bounds of marriage and this is what we're reading here in first corinthians 7 and that's why in ephesians 5 a husband and a wife they are commanded to love one another that the husband is commanded to love his wife as christ loved the church and the, the wife is com is commanded to submit to her husband and have this good relationship because if they don't have a good relationship then they're not taking care of the well-being of each other and this is one of the purposes of marriage now, because this relationship is such a strong emotional bond, if these intimate relationships are not respected and taken care of, people come, become very bitter. I mean, how many times do you hear about couples? I mean, think about it. everyone that gets married, they're so in love on their marriage day. But when they get divorced, they, they, they hate each other's guts to the point where they don't want anything to do with one another because, because that emotional bond is so strong when it's not respected and it's not taken care of, it, it, it creates a lot of bitterness um, in people. And this is why people who are once so loving to one another end up hating each other so much because you know a, a heart breaks as much as it loves you know the more you love somebody, the more you cared about somebody when they break your heart, when they don't take care of you, the, the more bitter you are going to be. So let's talk about another reason. Like if sex is not limited within the bounds of marriage, one thing you have to realize is fornication is almost inevitable when sex is not limited to marriage. And why is that? Like I talked about, this strong desire that we have um, will be sought elsewhere if it's not taken care of within marriage. Um, and I was talking about this with my wife. If you think about this, if a man and woman, let's say marriage didn't exist. If a man and woman just fornicate without commitment, basically the problem with that is if there's no commitment between people that are fornicating, then you have the problem of number one, spreading disease. We already talked about that. 
But then the other problem is you have the risk of creating children where they are no longer being raised in a stable environment. Because if people, two people aren't committed to one another, if they end up having a child through their fornication, because, you know, let's face it, people that are fornicating and they're using all these different ways to not get pregnant, eventually they, they don't want to use those different contraptions, right? And they want to actually, you know, you know, have the physical relationship without all these protective measures. And eventually children are raised in, by couples or they, the children are, are created by couples that don't have this commitment to one another. And that's a real problem because when you have that, you have children that are not being raised in a stable family, you have single parents, you have children that are orphans, or worse, right? You have children that are killed in the womb because the mother doesn't want to take care of that child. So that's a problem with just fornication without commitment. But let's say, let's say these people are partially committed to one another. They've sort of, you know, like, like you have a boyfriend and a girlfriend where they do have sort of a loyalty to one another, but they're not committed for life. And let's say this man and woman, they're fornicating over and over again after an extended period of time. You know, eventually, eventually they don't already have this sort of partial commitment, right? Or they're just sort of fornicating after an extended period of time. Eventually somebody is going to form an emotional attachment to the other person. Because that relationship is so intimate and because that relationship is so close, eventually two people that are just fornicating without a commitment, somebody will want a commitment. Why is that? Because they're sharing such an intimate moment that they're not going to want this other person to share that intimate moment with somebody else. And eventually somebody gets heartbroken, right? Because they actually want that exclusiveness even though um, when, they eventually, when they first went into it, they don't. So that's why when that relationship breaks, Eventually, people go on to gratify that sexual need somewhere else. And that's the problem with fornication. We go back to problem one, where we have the spread of disease. We have the risk of children being created. But see, if a man and woman is fornicating and they have an emotional attachment, and they have a commitment, they may as well get married, right? Because if they're going to commit to one another and fornicate, why don't they just get married and then commit to one another? And then they won't have the problem of spreading diseases. They won't have the problem of adding to the problem of fornication in society. And if they do create a child, then it's at least raised in a stable environment. And this is the problem when we have sex outside of marriage. I'll just show you this passage here in Leviticus 19, verse 29. Is that when fornication, when there isn't this marriage commitment of people committing to one another and staying together fornication eventually happens, like I said, because people go and they fulfill that sexual need somewhere else. And if they don't have the commitment in their second relationship, in their third relationship, they'll keep finding it. And this is why marriage has to fulfill that obligation. We need to take care of that obligation so that fornication does not spread. Look in Leviticus 19. It says, Do not prostitute thy daughter to cause her to be a whore, lest the land fall to whoredom, and the land become full of wickedness. You see, God recognize, God knows that if fornication abounds, then the land will fall to whoredom, and then the land will just become full of fornication. And we can see that already happening today when we don't honor marriage, we don't keep couples together, we have no laws forbidding adultery, we have no fault divorce, and fornication just abounds, and we have single parents, and we have uh, children raised out of wedlock, and we have children not raised, um, children having to be adopted by other people. Now this is why sex outside of marriage should not be normalized. And this is one of the problems with same-sex marriage is that it normalizes a sexual act outside of marriage and just contributes to the problem of adultery and fornication. And this is why it's so important that we teach our children to keep their virginity, you know, to, to keep their virginity, that sexual purity is important because once you lose your virginity, it's so much harder to stay sexually pure. Why is that? Because you now have awoken that desire. You now know what it feels like. It's like a drug addict, right? It's like somebody who takes drugs and they feel that euphoria. They feel that feeling. Now they're going to desire that feeling because they know what it feels like now. That's why it's so important to keep your virginity. It's so important for people to, you know, to be pure up until their wedding day because if you don't, it's going to be so much easier to continue to fornicate. And everybody knows that. 
Everybody who has fornicated before, you know that once you lose your virginity, it doesn't, you don't just leave it at that single time, right? Every time you lose your virginity, you go and you'll sleep again. You'll sleep with somebody else because your body now desires that. So it's really important for our children to learn why they have to, be, have to stay a virgin and why uh, not to awaken that desire before it's time because it's very hard after that to stop. And that's why people, you know, they, they go and they sleep around or they go and they watch pornography and it's really hard to get off that. Why? It's because that sexual desire is so strong and if, it's not, if you're not in a marriage, there's no way to fulfill that lawfully. But this is another reason why we need to allow our children to marry young. Because a lot of people have bought into this idea that, you know, children, you know, you, you want them to be successful and whatnot. So they, they, they leave school, then they go to uni, you want them to finish their degree or whatnot, and they just don't get married up until they're like 30. Especially in the Asian culture. In the Asian culture, people don't get married until sometimes they're in their mid-30s. But do you think people are really, you know, being abstinent all the way up to 35? Yes, some people might have reached all the way 35, being a virgin. But is that, a, is that something that should be put on them? Is that something that is normal and natural that God actually intended? No, God intended us to marry young. And that's why, you know, after people are around 16 to 18, they start developing this sexual desire because that is the encouragement to go out and find a wife to fulfill that sexual desire. And obviously we need to teach them um, the responsibility of being a husband and a wife. So what's another uh, purpose for marriage? Another purpose is it protects the ideal environment to raise children. Let's look at Ephesians 6, and we'll read here. Uh, Ephesians 6. It says here, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but nurture, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So we see here that fathers have an obligation to raise their children. And I could, we could go to all other passages as well. This is just the one passage I was thinking of when I was thinking of fathers raising their children, children honouring their father and mother. I mean, your father and mother have to be there in order for you to honour your mother and your father. So... This is one purpose for marriage is that it creates this ideal environment where children can be raised. Why? Because sex creates children. It's just a natural thing that happens when, when people sleep together, women get pregnant and they have children. And this is why sex is confined within marriage so that if a child is created, there is that protection for them to be raised by their biological mother and father. Now, family is so important in the Christian life that, you know, if you think about it, God is our father. You know, the, the family analogy is even used in the church where older men and, uh, should be treated as fathers and, and younger men as brothers, women as sisters, older women as mothers. This is how we are to relate to one another, that this idea of family is so important. If you think about it, even the picture of Jesus Christ and the church, where that even pictures the family, where, you know, the, the Jesus is sort of away, he's going to come back again. And what's the, what's the purpose of the church, right? The, the church works with Jesus to beget children, just like a father and mother beget children. But at the same time, the church nurtures and feeds the, the flock of God, you know, while the father is away, in a sense, where Jesus will be coming back one day. So you can kind of think about it that way as well. So what's the problem with same-sex marriage? Now, same-sex marriage adds basically to the weakening of this ideal, right? It's not the only thing that weakens family in a society, along with adultery and fornication. Homosexuality adds to that as well because it normalizes, like I said, it normalizes sexual activity outside of marriage. Now, and this is one thing, you know, one thing you gotta ask yourself is do homosexuals really exist in the sense that does a homosexual actually exist in the sense that they only sleep with somebody of the same gender? Because, you know, I, 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 it'd be really interesting to talk to people that are homosexuals and ask them whether they have engaged in sexual activity with people of the opposite gender as well. Because in the Bible, this is what we see. I mean, if we go to Leviticus 20 verse 13, it says here, if a man also lie with mankind, as he lieth with a woman. So the Bible almost assumes that 
people are having sexual relationships and then they go from that to something else. And a lot of the homosexuals that I have spoken to, you know, they have had sexual relationships with people of the opposite uh, gender as well. So they're not really always homosexuals. They're actually bisexual because they're having sex with both genders. Even in Romans 1, I won't tell you, but even in Romans 1, it's like they're already doing these unclean things and then God gives them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. So do homosexuals really exist in the sense that they only go to one gender or have all homosexuals also experimented with heterosexual intercourse also, and which actually makes them bisexual. You know, I don't really know. You know, I, I don't really want to make an absolute statement because I don't know. I do know that the Bible teaches that they swing both ways. Um, but who knows? Maybe, maybe that there, maybe there is, you know, a homosexual out there that has never slept with the opposite gender, and they've only slept with the same gender. But if you know, think about this, right? If monogamy actually existed amongst homosexuals which I don't know, I'm very doubtful that it does, but if it does, let's say, let's say somebody, they're, they're a homosexual and they've only had one partner and they treat that like marriage and they've never slept with anybody else. You know, if that were really the case, then I think the problem would be minimal. You know, I, I still have a problem with it, but I think it would be minimal in the sense that they, wouldn't have any, they couldn't never have any children and they wouldn't be fornicating around, right? I just don't that, think that is the reality where you have these homosexuals that are just one man, one woman for life, and they haven't ever slept with another woman, uh, with another person or another woman. Um, and if that was the case, God's laws have laws in place that would prohibit that. Because if you slept with a woman, the Bible teaches that you would then have to marry that woman. And therefore, if you went and committed homosexuality or you went and committed adultery, you would ultimately get put to death by the government. So it's something that would be stamped out. But like I said, if, they, if, if it was like that, which I'm highly doubtful it was, I think the, the problem at least would be minimized. But see, that's not what happens. You know, we can even see in reality, in society, when homosexuality is allowed, you know, fornication abounds, they are recognized then as a family, and then they want to have children. And this is the point we're at now. So I don't know whether people can really uh, ignore it or really argue against it, because when we look at reality, that's actually what's happening. What's actually happening out there and what's happening in our country is that homosexuality has been allowed, de facto relationships has been allowed, and now people are raising children outside the bounds of marriage. And not only are they not providing that stable relationship, but they are also denying children of their biological mother and father. So a couple of other questions that you can ask yourself as we think about this. You know, if marriage is only about adult relationships and it's not intrinsically linked to children, then why is it only two? You know, why is there a need to be faithful? You know, and, and you know, why, why, not, you know, why not experiment sexually, which is pretty much what the homosexual agenda is trying to teach to children in schools, right? That they should just experiment. They should just go out and sow their wild oats and just try all these different things and see how they feel. You know, they try and say if that gender ideology has nothing to do with redefining marriage. Well, if, if gender ideology has nothing to do with it, why is it LGBT, right? LGBT, T stands for transgender. So why are they being lumped into lesbian, bi, and, uh, and, and, and gay if it has nothing to do with it, right? Of course it's got something to do with it. Of course it's lumped into the same agenda. They even acknowledge that. Now, sexual purity... Within, like I said, sexual purity within the bounds of marriage is so crucial to the moral success of a society that God put the highest deterrent on acts. Um, God put the highest deterrent on acts that threaten it. So this is why homosexuality has the death sentence. This is why adultery has the death sentence. This is why bestiality has the death sentence. It's not that, it's not that we just want this bloodbath of people getting killed. It's the, the idea of the death sentence is to deter people from doing these things. So the reason why murder has the death sentence is because we're trying to deter people from murdering. It's not like we allow all this murder and then now we're going to institute the death sentence so that we can just kill all these people. No, no, no. The reason why the death sentence is there is because these, these sins are so serious in a society that God doesn't want them part of a society and that's why society should be instituting these laws. 
So I'm not saying that we are for going out and being a vigilante, you know, people just going and killing people that are committing adultery or committing bestiality and homosexuality. No, what we're saying is that if a, go if a, if a government was righteous and really cared about the social well-being of a nation and protecting marriage, they would institute these laws so that it would be a strong deterrent against, you know, certain kinds of fornication and adultery included is homosexuality. Now, one thing is fornication, which is just between unmarried couples. Now that ultimately can be remedied by marriage. And this is why fornication between unmarried people doesn't warrant the death sentence, but then homosexuality, adultery, and bestiality do because these people cannot be married um, because somebody who's in adultery is already married to somebody else and you can't marry somebody of the same gender and you obviously can't marry an animal. Now I'm bringing it in for a landing here, but just a couple of other things. Now I'm not a legal expert, but one of the other problems with same-sex, you know, redefining marriage is obviously some of the legal consequences. And as you talk to people that are more knowledgeable about, you know, the Discrimination Act and all these things, they'll tell you that once you redefine the word marriage in Australian law, then you have problems with the, you know, the Sexual Discrimination Act and all these other discrimination acts and, you know, how they run schools and all these different things. Now, I don't know all the different uh, elements of that, but I'm sure that they are out there. I mean, you already have charities in New Zealand being deregistered because they stand for family. And that's one of the things, even this church, you know, we're registered as a charity. And one of the things that they require of charities is that you keep certain laws and you don't discriminate and blah, blah, blah. So if you want to have that certain charity status, that's going to affect that. Now, do I think the government should be regulating charities and things like that? No, I don't. So obviously I don't agree with all these laws. Like, you know, people are worried about what, what government's gonna teach in schools. I don't even think government should be in the school business. I think schools should be a privatized, uh, um, privatized industry. But these are things that people have to think about. These are things that will, will change things. So people that just think marriage is just gonna be redefined and life is just gonna go on as normal. No, no, there's gonna be laws that are going to change. And both parties realize this. It's just that the Labour and the Greens, they just don't care, right? They're just pushing their ideology. But the Liberals, they know. They know things are gonna change. Um, but they just, some people, I don't know, they just don't care. So there could be changes to charities. Uh, there could be changes to marriage celebrants, you know, the, the different laws that they're regulated by, the Discrimination Act, things that happen in schools, you know. This basically will give a green light to the Safe Schools program and teaching all this gender ideology in, in public schools. Um, who knows how it's going to affect religious institutions? You know, they always talk about freedom of religion, even though the word marriage is going to be re redefined. But then you've got to ask the question, well, who's going to be classified as an exempt religious institution? Right? It's kind of like now. I mean, I don't even know if this church is, is identified as the government, by the government as a religious institution, because we're not listed as one of, the re, uh, you know, one of the registered denominations that the government recognizes. So what if the government says, oh yeah, we're going to give freedom to religious institutions, but only if you're an institution that we recognize. You know, so otherwise we're just a charity. We're just another charity. We're not necessarily a religious institution to them. Who knows how things are going to change? But my point is, you know, there are problems with same-sex marriage. You know, it destroys the family. You know, homosexuality is a sin, you know, and also there are legal consequences to changing the definition of marriage in the Marriage Act. So redefining marriage you know it just takes our country one step further from where we need to be we're already on this downward spiral you know we've already devalued marriage by allowing no-fault divorce we've already devalued marriage by legitimizing fornicating relationships you know where the government acknowledges de facto and just treats de facto like a marriage relationship you know we're already allowing people to murder the fruit of the womb from having too much fornication in our society and we're allowing abortions to happen. And now we have the redefinition of marriage to include same-sex relationships. So 
one thing you've got to understand, it's not that same-sex relationships and redefining marriage is just this Pandora's, the, the, the box of Pandora is just being opened all of a sudden, all these things are going to happen. No, no, this, this is already another step in a decline that has been happening over the last few decades. And it's just going to keep pushing forward and it's just going to keep getting worse. So even in this instance, even though it's just about the, the word marriage and there are some certain legal consequences, that already is enough to stop it. But we just have to stop this tide of our country just going down the toilet one step at a time, even though these steps are not linked. Because if it's same-sex marriage, what's next? You know, and if, you don't even have to ask that question because you can just look overseas and you can see what's happening in the US. You can see now with the transgender ideology that's happening out there, you got people saying that they're black when they're white and you got people, you know, these men saying that they now identify as a six-year-old girl and they want to go to kindergarten. I mean, where does it end when you get away from absolute truth? So it's just another step in a multitude of steps that have already been taken and that's why you know we have to stop it we have to do what we can you know we have to vote no obviously and we have to tell people why there is a problem uh, with homosexuality and why there's a problem with same-sex marriage all right i hope I, I know it was a bit of a long sermon but i hope you guys learned something just a few of my thoughts on this issue and some of the things that the bible has to say about it but i hope you learned something um, let's pray all right, Lord, we thank you for your word. Um, thank you for um, just giving us an absolute truth that we can guide our life by. I pray, Lord, um, you know, in this day and age, it's not easy to take the biblical stands, Lord. You know, these, these doctrines and these things are not popular. But Lord, help us to understand why you have these things in place. So Lord, we can do the best we can to defend the Bible, defend your truth. And Lord, you know, I don't know if in this country, Lord, we'll ever get back to a biblical standard of morality and laws. But I pray, Lord, that we'd at least be able to stop the move forward, that we'd at least be able to edge it back a bit. Lord, that we'd be able to have a positive impact on this country, even though we will, may never get back or we will never get back, most likely, to the way it should be in your, in your word. But we pray, Lord, help us to be bold, help us to take the stand, help us to be knowledgeable on what we believe. Help us to not be these ignorant or deceived Christians that go out and uh, are for same-sex marriage. And I pray, Lord, that we would, uh, when we come across people like this, that we are able to correct them uh, with respect and with love. So we pray, Lord, for all these things. Preserve our country. Um, Lord, just uh, help us not to be, the, help us to be the country that said no to same-sex marriage. And we pray, Lord, these things in Jesus' name. Amen.